Well, that's interesting. Turns out everybody chose question two. <laughs> so uh, we can jump right into these questions and we'll talk about them together. So number one, uh, actually one group chose this question. Why does the poem talk about these waves beginning and then ending and then beginning again? So let's look at the poem. Page six. The sea is calm tonight. This is probably the easiest sentence in this poem. The tide is full. The moon lies fair. Fair means beautiful upon the straits. The strait, as I'm sure you know, because we live in Taiwan, is a narrow body of water, Haisha. And here it's talking about the water between England and France. On, so he's looking from England across the water to France. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. So he sees a light and then the light disappears. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. OK, so here he has a static image. It's a picture that is not there's nothing really happening. It's just a, a static picture. Uh, France is over there. The light has gone here in England. We still have the light. It's glimmering. And the water is peaceful, tranquil. So already we have a comparison. The light has gone out in France, but it's still here in England. Question, what is going on in France at this time? War, yes. We had the French Revolution in 1789, followed by 30 years of war because of some guy named Napoleon. So when he's saying the light has gone out in France, he's talking about the light of peace, the light of reason, the light of historical progress. Everything in Europe is chaos. But in, in England, uh, everything is still peaceful. Napoleon has not, at this time, not yet, attacked England. Turns out Napoleon would never attack England. He would only fight the English Navy. He wouldn't actually invade England. But at this time, they didn't know that. Come to the window. So he's talking to somebody. The speaker is talking to somebody. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air. Only, only is a transition. From the long line of spray. Spray is when the wave hits the shore and the water sprays up. So spray is actually talking about the waves. From the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land. So again, this is nighttime. Blanched means to turn white. So the land has been turned white by the moon. So from these waves hitting the land, listen. You hear the grating roar. Uh, uh, so you can imagine the sound of the waves. The roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Strand means beach. So remember, in England, most beaches are not sand. They're pebbles. So here it's describing when the water uh, before the wave comes, the water will go back, right? So he's saying that the water will bring some of the pebbles back. And then when it, a wave comes, it will take the same pebbles and throw them back onto the beach. So this image is the same pebbles drawn into the water and then flung back onto the land, drawn back into the water, flung back onto the land in an endless cycle. As it says, line 12, begin and cease and then again begin. With tremulous, tremulous means like trembling, cadence, which means rhythm, slow. 
and bring the eternal note of sadness in. So we have the image of nature going in a circle, pebbles being uh, brought in a circle, not really useful, not really doing anything. And it's a slow movement. We're in no hurry. And he says that this brings sadness into the scene. So to him, this is a sad thing. Uh, why? Well, we can quickly look. Uh, stanza two, Sophocles. Sophocles is an ancient Greek tragedian. He's a playwright. Uh, Sophocles wrote uh, Oedipus the King, Oedipus. Uh, and then the next stanza, the sea of faith was once too at the full. So if you compare religious faith to an ocean, he's saying that ocean used to be full, but today no longer. Ah, love, let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new. In fact, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. So back to the original question. Why begin and cease and then again begin? Well, it looks like he's talking about how human history also repeats itself. So even back in ancient Greece, Sophocles was thinking about this. Uh, and then when we think about religion, religion is also starting to fail. Religion, especially Christian religion, the idea is that you can move from sinner to elected. You can move from ordinary person to somebody who enters heaven. There's a kind of improvement. There's a kind of progress. But here the central imagery is of a circle. A circle is not progress. And so in that sense, faith is also breaking down. Instead of that improvement, now it is turning back around into a circle. So why does it emphasize begin and cease and then again begin? Because that's the central idea of the poem, that things are not in fact improving. Even though in the 19th century, everybody believed in historical progress, but in fact, we're not improving. We're only going in circles. And, you know, Arnold, Matthew Arnold, takes a very, uh, I think, apt image. The image fits his idea very well. Waves don't really go anywhere. And if a pebble is caught in a wave, it also doesn't really go anywhere. It's just there forever. OK, question two, the very popular question two. Is this a love poem? Why or why not? Before I realized everybody was talking about the same question, I talked with a couple of groups and they gave me different answers. That's not true. No, they gave me the same answer. They all think it's not a love poem. Anyone think it is a love poem? Okay, some people do. And I think if you if you believe this is a love poem, you're probably focusing on line 29. Ah, love, let us be true to one another. This seems pretty straightforward, right? I'm talking to somebody. I call them love. And I'm saying we must be true to one another. We must truly love one another. But is this the main point of the poem? If we continue, for means because, right? Because the world, which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so it seems like a beautiful world. Various means full of different things. It's beautiful, it's new, but in fact it hath, hath means has. So it, in fact it doesn't have joy or love or light. It doesn't have certitude, which means anything that you can trust. It doesn't have peace and it doesn't have help 
for pain, so it doesn't have comfort. And we are here as on a darkling plane. Darkling just means dark, you can't see, you don't know what's going on. As means as if. We are here as if this place is a dark plane swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight. Alarm here means the signal to attack, like in a battle between two armies. If an army gives the alarm, that means that they should attack. But these are confused alarms uh, of struggle, which means fighting, and of flight, which means running away. So who is fighting whom? Who is fighting? Who is running? What the hell is going on? It's confusion. Where ignorant armies clash by night. Ignorant here means they don't know what the fuck's going on. So if we look at the beginning, right? Time is a circle, nothing improves. They said so in ancient Greece. Now faith is also failing. There's nothing good in the world. We're all here like we're fighting and we don't know what we're fighting for. Love this part, lines uh, 29 and 30, are the only good parts of this poem. <laughs> oh, okay, not really. The, the part about the lights in England still glimmering and vast, this is also good. Compared to France, England is still standing. But these are the only two good parts of the poem. Everything else is the world is, uh, as we say in English, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. So is this a love poem? If you disagree, you probably think that here the poet mentions love as a kind of value that he wants to protect. In a world where nothing else is left, not even like love in the general sense. The poet wants to protect love in the specific sense. Let us be true, me and you. The world can go to hell, but I still have you. Um, but is it because they're in love or is it because it's better than everything else? So really the answer to this question, is this a love poem, is a question of emphasis. Do you think the poem is about the power of love to survive anything? Or is it about how everything is terrible and the only thing we have left is specific love for a specific person? Moving on to the next poem, The White Man's Burden. Is it a realistic portrayal of colonialism? So let's take, let's take a look. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Breed means rear, which means bring up, raise. So basically send your best children. As it says in the next line, go bind your sons to exile. So they are living in another country to serve your captives need. So it, it's talking about the local people as captives, prisoners, and that the white man has to serve them and to give them what they need. To wait in heavy harness, wait means serve. Like uh, if you go to a restaurant, the person who serves you is called a waiter. So to wait here means to serve. To wait in heavy harness. Harness is the thing that you put on a horse. So it's comparing the white colonizer to a horse. To wait on somebody is to serve somebody. So to serve fluttered folk and wild. Folk means people. This just means fluttered and wild people. Flutter. The word flutter today is the sound of a bird flapping its wings. So it gives the image of being uncertain, being unprepared, uncultured. It's kind of like running around, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, as my dear mother says, 
uh, and these people are your new caught sullen people. Sullen means unhappy. Half devil and half child. So it's saying that the local people are like children. They can't take care of themselves. They aren't fully people, but they're also like devils. They're here just to torture the white men. They're specifically trying to make the life of the white colonizer worse. Uh, the next stanza is about the attitude that the white colonizer must have. To keep your pride in check, to keep your terror inside you, and to seek another's profit. Profit here means benefit. So you have to put your own emotions aside and work for the benefit of the local people. Uh, the next stanza is about doing the work. You have to fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. So these are the things that you must do for the local people. And when your goal is nearest, when you almost have achieved your goal, when the end means the goal, for others sought. So the goal is not for you, it's for others. You're working for the local people. When you're almost successful, you must watch sloth, which means laziness, and heathen folly. Folly means doing something stupid. Heathen means not a Christian. So it's again, it's talking about the local people. You have to watch laziness and the stupidity of the local people bring all your hope to not. Not means nothing. So I guess in Chinese we would say gong kui yi kui, right? You're just about to succeed, but you fail, and here it says it's because the local people are lazy and stupid. I think we can start to answer this question already. Is this a realistic portrayal of colonialism? Well, objectively speaking, of course not. You can't just call an entire people lazy and stupid, right? If they're not cooperating with the white colonizer, they have good reasons. Maybe they don't think that British culture is suitable for them. Maybe they don't like the way that the British are trying to spread their culture. And maybe the specific British people in charge are the real idiots and they're uh, fighting against the British because the British are going to ruin everything. So it's not a realistic portrayal to say that we white people are here to improve you, to help you live better, but you're always preventing us from helping you. There is, however, a part of this poem that is very realistic, and that is the mindset of someone who believes in colonialism. For someone like the poet Rudyard Kipling, who believes that it is the British mission to spread British culture around the world, they do believe that they are, whatever they're doing is for the benefit of the local people. And because we are doing good things for you, if you don't agree, you must be either stupid or lazy. Either you have incorrect ideas of what is good, which is stupid, or you're not willing to work for those ideas, which is lazy. Um, and of course, this becomes a big problem. If the people in charge don't see what the real issues are, or they don't recognize that different cultures are not better or worse, they're just different, that can lead to a lot of problems. And that's why um, near the end of the 19th century, more and more British colonies rebelled against the British and started fighting against the British. And even then, people who supported colonialism didn't understand why. Instead of thinking, wait, is this a good idea? They kept blaming the local people for not doing what is best for them. So 
in terms of what was actually happening in those countries, it's not realistic. But in terms of what people who really believe in colonialism were thinking, it is quite realistic. And in fact, the poem itself is propaganda. Right. The poem was written to encourage more young white men to go and colonize or work in colonies around the world. Even though the local people hate you, even though people are starting to fight against the British, the poet still believes that it is worth doing, that colonialism is worth doing. Uh, so, in fact, we can think about this poem compared to uh, last week, My Last Duchess. Remember the poem where the guy is trying to get a new wife and he accidentally reveals that he killed his previous wife and he doesn't think anything is wrong? So in that poem, we readers are at an ironic distance from the main character. He thinks everything is fine. We know that it's not fine at all. There's a distance. But in this poem, the poet wholeheartedly believes in what he is saying. The distance between reader and poet is not inside the poem. The distance is because we believe something very different from what the poet believes. Okay, number four, why is this poem written in iambic trimeter? Uh, let's see. Take up the white man's burden, have done with childish days. The lightly proffered laurel, the easy ungrudged praise, comes now to search your manhood through all the thankless years. Cold edged with dear bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers. That rhythm, how does that make you feel? Some people say it feels like you're on a military march, Xing Jing. Some people say that it, it feels like it's giving you energy, like it's a very specific rhythm and it's easy to just go along with this rhythm. And in fact, that might be why it is written in this rhythm in this meter because it's trying to convince you to do something, to join all of the other young white men in the colonies to uh, further the, the aims of colonialism, to keep working to promote British culture. It's not asking you to think, is this a good idea? It's not asking you to maybe consider going. It's telling you, to take up the white man's burden. It's like an order. And so all of these negative aspects, right? The local people hate you. They won't cooperate. Nobody will thank you. These are noted as not obstacles. These are noted as challenges. Challenges that you should overcome. Even though there's all of this bad stuff happening, you should still in fact, even more should you work to promote British culture. So the perspective is very clear. And the meter helps to promote that perspective. Um, think about. Think about the sonnet. Back all the way back in week two. Uh, we said that a sonnet is usually divided into eight lines and six lines. Or for Shakespeare, ten lines and two lines. And that between these two halves, there is a twist. You could join the. And then in the middle, the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. Very certain, very predictable. In that sense, the sonnet. Tells the poet how to fit his ideas into the poem. The structure and the meter of the poem help to decide the content and the thinking of the poem. In the same way, in this poem, the meter 
helps to decide the perspective of the poem. As a kind of marching rhythm, it is encouraging you to face and overcome these challenges. So even though the content is all negative, it is portrayed as something that you can conquer, not something that you should be scared of. So the short answer to why is this poem written in iambic trimeter is as uh, to help it do the job of propaganda. OK, and number five. Are these two poems reacting to the same historical situation? Technically, no. As we said, Dover Beach is mainly reacting to what's happening in Europe. Napoleon, the French Revolution killing all the rich noble landowners. Napoleon fighting a war with seven different countries at the same time and winning. Um, Dover Beach is more about how like the values that we think are important in Europe, the, the old system of like nobles and common people, king and, and like subjects is falling apart. All of the traditions that we believed in that guided our societies is falling apart. And so when everything is going to hell, we have to grab on to each other. The white man's burden is looking outside of Europe. Throughout the world, Africa, South America, Asia, India, when these colonies no longer welcome us, when we realize that not everybody thinks that English culture is the best, and so people will not always willingly accept our culture. We shouldn't give up. We should work harder. So in a sense, they are about very different things, but there's something that connects them, which is that in both cases, what seemed like a promising development turns into a very bad situation for um, white Europeans. So like at the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, seven countries versus one Napoleon, of course we're gonna win. Turns out, no. Turns out Napoleon is a military genius, like once in a century military genius. So it, what looked like an easy job turned out to be almost impossible. Uh, and colonialism also, right? Our culture is the best culture. Who would refuse our culture? Turns out everybody. And so what looked like a good thing turns into a terrible challenge. Um, and so in both poems, we have the idea that history does not actually progress in a straight line. And this is moving into question six. How can you tell that it was written in the Victorian period? If you look at the bottom half. Uh, rebellious empire and fin de siècle aestheticism. So here we have the rebellious empire. Right, the white man's burden. Um, but also fin de siècle, this, is, this idea is that at the end of the century, fin de siècle, this is French for end of the century, everything we believed in the middle of the century turned out to be wrong. So what did they believe in the middle of the century? With enough energy, ingenuity, which means creativity, optimism, you can bring about progress and utilitarianism. You can work to improve everybody's situation. By the end of the century, many people no longer believe this because it's not what was happening. Uh, also contributing to this idea is the new scientific discoveries, right? Evolution, biology, uh, before evolution, they thought that God created humans 5,000 years ago. Uh, and so everything is decided. Everything is sure. But with evolution, Darwin said, no, 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 it's all chance. It's all probability. So you can't even trust your biology. Same for geology. 
The Bible said God created the world 5,000 years ago. Turns out the world is divided into different sections, and each section is slowly moving, and the earth is slowly changing. So you can't even trust the ground beneath your feet. Same for history. When they started discovering stuff older than 5,000 years ago, it also cast doubt on their religious beliefs. And math. I mentioned last week, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland is a reaction to how crazy the new kind of math is. It doesn't make sense. You can't use the new math to count things. You can't say here is I number of apples. Uh, so many people also thought this math um, no longer felt like math, no longer felt like something you can absolutely depend on. So these discoveries, the rebellious empire, um, all of this stuff added up to create the fin de siècle or end of the century pessimism. And that's mainly what we see in these two poems. Um, we are not seeing aestheticism yet, Zhui, or some say Zhui. That will come, I think, next week. Uh, so what else do we have here? Strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The idea that on the surface, you're a, a great doctor, you help people, but at night you turn into a monster who kills people is another way of looking at colonialism. On the surface, you're bringing British culture around the world, you're helping everybody, but in the dead of night, when you count the bodies, you start thinking, are we helping or are we hurting these people? Yeah, okay, so those are today's discussion questions. Do you want to ask me anything? Okay, uh, that was fast. Why is that? Oh yeah, because I didn't let you discuss. Okay. Um, next week, I believe it's also two poems. Let me check. Page, oh. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I cut that part. Sorry. So we do have to talk about aestheticism. Right. So we don't see it in today's poems, but when they could no longer believe in historical progress, when they no longer believed that they could really help people, they started to focus on art that is not related to history that is not related to politics. So for example, uh, for example, Oscar Wilde, Wang Erde, famously said that art should be only for art's sake. Art for art's sake. Art should not be used to promote some kind of message. Art should not support some kind of ideology, should not try to change people's minds. It should simply celebrate what is beautiful. And so he wrote um, works like the picture of Dorian Gray, a guy who stays young forever because he has a painting of himself that grows old instead of him. And since he can never die, he can do all sorts of crazy stuff and nothing will really hurt him. And so you get uh, a novel about a beautiful young man who does really crazy stuff. People would think it's immoral, it's a bad message, but Oscar Wilde didn't care. As long as it was a, a beautiful person doing uh, interesting things, he thought it was good art. So ideas like that. When the world isn't working for you, you retreat from the world. Uh, I guess in Chinese we call this ying tui. Okay, so I guess I'm going to introduce the, I still don't believe this. Oh, it's, uh, it's right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I guess I'm now going to introduce the 20th century. Let's take a short break and we come back. I will introduce the last literary period 
of the semester. The, um, we're spending more time on the 20th century. Because first of all, I think you will be more familiar with what's going on. But also because the 20th century is the time of the novel. We're not going to read a novel, obviously. We don't have time to read a whole novel, but we are going to read more short stories. And uh, I don't think you can handle more than one short story per week. So we're going to spend a few more weeks in the 20th century. OK, let's take a short break.
the 20th century, in fact, is not just the 20th century. It includes everything up to today. Uh, and the reason is because the 21st century is too new. Historians, literary historians, still disagree about how to divide the 20 from the 21st century and what to call the 21st century. So for now, we're just calling everything the 20th century. Uh, in 1903, the Wright brothers achieved flight in the United States. This is the birth of the airplane. And so when previously we had the telegram so to enable instantaneous communication, now we have the possibility of going anywhere in the world within 24 hours. And it creates an even more globalized and interconnected world. In 1913, Sigmund Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams was published in English. The original was published in German in 1900. Uh, if you don't know, this is Foloida de Meng de Jieshi. It is the most influential book of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, Jing Sen Fen Xi, is a very different way of looking at the human mind. Traditionally, the human mind was thought to have three parts, reason, passion, and conscience. Freud also thought the mind has three parts, but instead of these three, he said that we have the superego, the ego, and the id. In Chinese, cao wo, zi wo, ben wo. And the idea is that for every situation, humans know what we should do and have something that we want to do. And often these two will be different. So how do we decide actually what to do? We always have to negotiate between the superego and the id. The ego is nothing more than the product of that negotiation. In other words, the self does not exist. The self is the result of negotiation and compromise for every situation. And in this way, Freud fractured and fragmented the self. Instead of thinking of humans as individuals who make choices for themselves, uh, Freud thinks of humans as always a struggle with oneself. We're always fighting against ourselves to decide what we should do. And so this is this was a very, very, very influential idea in the history of ideas. Today, when we talk about repression, ya yi, when we talk about trauma, chuang sang, when we talk about um, drives, all of these come from psychoanalysis. So even if you don't know anything about psychoanalysis, you know some of the more popular ideas, like uh, uh, the Oedipus complex, right? Also from psychoanalysis. Um, so of course it had a major effect on literature as well. You often notice in literature of the 20th century and after, characters are no longer entire complete people who have a single dimension of what to do in each situation. Like I mentioned a few weeks ago, my book club this month is reading Jane Eyre, which is a novel from the early 19th century, Jane Ai. And so in this novel, the characters are all very certain. They have a very specific personality. And in different situations, they behave in predictable ways. But starting in the 20th century, this changes. People will contradict themselves. People will do things that they know are not the right decision. People will argue with people they love, and they will go grow close with people they hate. And this is because of Freud's ideas 
about how the mind is not a single thing. It is always a constant struggle and compromise. By the way, did you know that Freud is a fraud? Has a good Yeah, so uh, recently, and by recently, I mean in the last 20 years, uh, researchers had the chance to go through Freud's personal papers and diaries, and they discovered that Freud started out a very traditional psychiatrist. But uh, in his practice, his young female patients kept telling him that they were being abused and mistreated by their parents and by people they trusted. Uh, and Freud, because he's also not, he's also a very superficial man, mostly took rich patients. And so his patients were basically telling him that these rich and powerful men in society were all evil, manipulative fathers and uncles and public figures. When he tried to publish these results, nobody believed him. And so he had a choice to make. Should he stand up and fight for these abused patients and try to bring them some kind of comfort and justice? Or should he do something else to help his career? He chose number two. And so he decided that when his patients were talking about being abused and mistreated, they were actually talking about fantasies and dreams and secret desires. And so he said that these stories weren't real, they reflected something in his patient's mind. And that's how he came up with these theories about the fractured mind. Uh, and uh, if you examine his later work, turns out that he didn't do a proper job of dealing with the data. His interpretations were self-contradictory. He was addicted to cocaine. Uh, and like lots of crazy stuff. So Freud's theories are not scientific, or at least they started out as unscientific. But the thing about the human mind is that the human mind is not, a, not just another body organ. The mind deals with interpretation, and interpretation is always affected by the culture and the environment. So yes, Freud started out saying bullshit, but when more and more people believed it, and when that kind of logic started influencing, influencing the culture and influencing the way that people think about human psychology, then in fact, some of those ideas will start to match what we see in patients' behavior and thinking. So what started out as false slowly some parts of it turned into truth. And today studies show that long-term psychoanalysis, it results in better mental health than short-term therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy or other kinds of specific focused therapy. Uh, and one other reason for this is because psychoanalysis is not just about worshiping Freud. Psychoanalysis has developed very far from the early days when Freud was saying whatever he thought people wanted to hear. Um, so psychoanalysis today is a well-developed, highly theoretical field that can bring actual benefits to people. But you should know that it began with somebody spewing bullshit. From 1914 to 1918 was the First World War when Britain and France fought against Germany and, okay, it's not called Germany. Uh, it's called the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It later became Germany after they lost the war. And also they fought uh, on the side of today, what we call Germany was also uh, the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman World War I is very influential because first for many reasons, but one reason is because the losers separated into many different countries. The Ottoman Empire ended because of World War I. 
the Austro-Hungarian Empire ended because of World War One. Uh, and we got closer to what Europe looks like today. Also, another reason this is a very important war is because it is the first large scale war to use mechanical weapons. I'm talking about machine guns. I'm talking about me uh, mechanized artillery. When the war started, most armies in Europe were still thinking in traditional ways. When you fight on the battlefield, you pull out a sword and you go attack the other side individually. Um, before the invention of the rifle, Lai Fu Chang, you had a, a gun called the musket, Mao Chang. And the difference is that the musket fired a round ball. If you know how what a bullet looks like, right? The, the shape of a bullet, it's flat on one side, it's round on the other. That's because when you fire a bullet, the bullet spins. And by spinning, it can cut through the air and go much farther without losing speed. Muskets did not spin. Musket balls were simply metal balls that were pushed out into the air. So if you look at movies set in like the early or late 18th century or even the 19th century, um, when they, they do have guns, but they don't fire from far away, right? You have the two armies are like lining up, right? They're, they're in formation and they're trying to line up and find the right direction to fight the other side. And this is because their guns could not fire very far. So they had to make a, a decision. If you fire your gun too early, it will not hurt the enemy. But if you fire your gun too late, you get shot first. And after you fire once, you have to take two minutes to reload because you have to um, open a new pack of gunpowder, pour it into the gun. Then you have to take out a new musket, uh, a musket ball, put it into the gun. And then you have to uh, like put in uh, cotton stuffing in order to make sure it explodes and pushes out. And you have to take a stick and you have to shove it all inside the gun. It takes two minutes to reload. So you really have to be very careful when you fire the gun. And that's why um, at the beginning of the First World War, people still thought of war as a contest of wills, man on man, one on one, sword fights, because the guns were shit. They didn't do anything. So most war was still about physically attacking the other person. But with machine guns and rifles, guns could fire much further distances um, and they can fire faster. You no longer have to wait two minutes between each shot. In fact, for the most powerful machine guns called Gatling guns, uh, you might recognize them. These are the guns that, that rotate. Um, they can fire thousands of bullets at a, at the time at one time. The limit to how many shots they can fire is when the gun overheats. And so you can imagine, right? If one side is still fighting a traditional one-on-one -on -one battle, and the other side has machine guns, it's not a fair fight. Example: At the beginning of World War One. The British military was still wearing bright red uniforms. Today we think that a, the job of a uniform is to hide your soldiers on the battlefield. But in traditional warfare, it didn't matter if the other side could see you, they couldn't hit you. So in fact, for the British, it was more important to show the enemy how many soldiers we have as a psychological tactic. We want to scare them before we fight them. But if the other side has machine guns, they can hit you as soon as they see you. So at the beginning of the First World War, um, casualties on both sides were terrible. They had machine guns, but they didn't think about what that means for me when I'm being attacked. And so very quickly, 
1914, 1915, they developed new ideas about uniforms, about strategy, about how to use technology. But it took a while uh, to get there, and many, many people died. Even after they developed the new strategies, the new strategies were also terrible. We had what's called trench warfare, Hao Zanzen. The idea of trench warfare is as a defensive strategy. You dig a hole in the ground to hide from the machine guns. Okay, yeah, so you can live, but how do you win? How do you attack the other side? And the answer that they came up with is to keep throwing people at the enemy. In Chinese, we call this Ren Hai Zan Shu. And so this led to battles with literally over a million people dying in a single battle. Um, because and in the end, what decided the winner in a trench battle is how many people you are willing to sacrifice. What I'm saying is World War I literally changed the world. It's not called a world war because the whole world participated. It's called a world war because the world changed after this war. Not really, I'm just saying that, but it's a way to remember this. Um, so. Let's, let's see, how should we connect this? So like next week, we're going to read some poetry from World War One, and the poems mainly focus on how war is not a glorious battle. War is not to bring you honor. It, to die for your country is not a good thing. Uh, your officers and leaders may not know what they're doing, and you can't even trust your own people. Something like that. In the middle of the war, 1915, uh, we have James Fraser's The Golden Bow. I think in Chinese we call this Jing Zhi Cha. The Golden Bough is a collection of Western myths and folk tales. It's usually considered one of the most complete collections, uh, going all the all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome. The thing about the Golden Bough is that it's also very psychoanalytical in the sense that these stories don't fit together. We think of one tradition, but in fact, these stories come from many different traditions and they don't express a single idea. So when Fraser put all of these stories together, people realized what we thought of as our single tradition is actually many different things. So when we say be like the ancient Greeks, OK, which ones? Or like we should do what the Romans did, OK, which part? So um, in this sense, the Golden Bough did for mythology and tradition what the interpretation of dreams did for the human mind. It showed us that it is not one complete thing. It is a fragmented, fragmentary division. Uh, and it also went on to inspire many writers of the period. Um, at, during this period, uh, late, a bit after World War One, late 1910s, early 1920s, we had a literary movement called modernism. In Chinese, we call this Xin Dai Zhuyi. Modernism is born from the realization that our culture and our tradition is not solid. It is not something that we can hold on to and trust. So in the late Victorian era, they st they stopped believing in progress, but at least they had the past. During modernism, they also lost faith in the past. And so authors uh, following the modernist ideas try to find some part of the past that they can still preserve. And so the Golden Bough, this collection of myths, became very important. If we can't follow the entire tradition, at least we can follow part of the tradition, and which part they can check the golden bow. So when your belief is fragmented and incomplete, and you don't have something solid to hold on to, 
then your ideas and your uh, aesthetics, the presentation of ideas, will also reflect this fragmentation. So the literature of modernism is full of cultural references that nobody understands. It uses experimentation in form to express new ideas. The most common thing that students say about lit modernist literature is that it is hard to understand. And up to now, like we have been reading things that may not be easy to understand, but I keep saying, oh, it was easy for people in the past to understand. It's just because we are living today that it's hard. But for modernist literature, it was hard for people of the past to understand. You really had to get what the author is trying to do and trying to say. And in fact, uh, for authors like T.S. Eliot, who wrote his most famous poem is called The Wasteland. We're not going to read it because it's too hard, but it begins with Italian and includes Latin and ancient Greek. And it has footnotes, but the footnotes make things more confusing. And for an author like James Joyce, you may recognize his name in Chinese. Chai si. Anyone? He appeared in your high school history textbook. One line. Yeah, um, his most famous work is called Ulysses, Ulysses, um, and it's not actually about Odysseus. It's about some guy in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, it's about one day in his life. But it's divided into different chapters, and each chapter resembles one adventure that Odysseus went on or experienced. So like there's a chapter that's related to fighting the Cyclops. There's a chapter related to um, uh, like, like descending into hell. But the author doesn't tell you this. You have to find it on your own. And also each chapter represents a different historical style of English. So one chapter is written in Old English. One chapter is written in Middle English. One chapter is written in this style. One chapter is written in that style. I'm not kidding when I say that many, many professors spend their whole career studying this one book. One book, and it's not even Joyce's most hardest book. He, later on, he wrote something even harder. Uh, that book is called Finnegan's Wake, Finnegan Soling Ye. And it's so hard that there's no Chinese version. It's a classic, but the Chinese version is currently being translated by my PhD supervisor at Sida. He's still working on it. He's been working on it for 10 years. And it's hard to translate because, um, like I mentioned in Ulysses, Joyce makes all of these references. But at least you can recognize the words. In Finnegan's Wake, the references go inside of the word. So he might spell a word in a very weird way because this word is pointing to three different things at the same time. Uh, and the entire book is written like that. So scholars of this book debate questions like who is the protagonist what happens in this chapter who is talking to whom what time of day does this happen basic questions nobody oh, few people can agree because joyce is going in so many different directions at the same time and on top of that you have to think about how do you make a book like you can write it, but then you have to find somebody to print it. And the printer has to match each letter that you want on each page, right? Usually it's not hard because the printer can understand what you're saying. But if the printer cannot understand what you're saying, and you also spell words in a very weird way, and nothing makes sense, 
it's much easier for the printer to make mistakes. So scholars also have to ask themselves, did Joyce write this or is this a printer mistake? And this is the kind of thing that people think of when they think of modernism. Things that are hard to read. And the reason is because these authors are struggling with trying to find something solid in their past or in their culture. And if they, they're trying to find it, and that attempt, that effort, is what they put on the page. So basically, if you don't know what you're talking about, you write modernist literature. But we do have some specific literary techniques that came from modernism and that uh, were preserved in later literature. So when authors stopped trying to be hard to understand, some of these techniques stayed and people slowly got used to them. For example, free verse, which is usually called in the French term verse libre, which just means free verse. Free verse is poetry without meter. In Chinese, we call this xing si. Mei you lu de si. It does not mean there is no meter. It means there is no regular meter. Mei you gui lu de ge lu. But in fact, poetry still has to pay attention to rhythm and rhyme and assonance and metaphor and enjambement and all of these things. It's just not predictable. Now you can also use changing meters in the same poem to help express your ideas. You don't have to follow a strict pattern. Another idea that uh, was passed down is called the objective correlative. Today we just call this symbolism. The idea is that when a character feels something, they see something in the world that reflects that feeling. So, for example, uh, if they fall in love, then suddenly everywhere they can see like birds coming together and squirrels coming together, that kind of thing. Or if they feel angry, then suddenly the doors sound louder when they close, the TV sounds more noisy. The world reflects the emotions of the character. If you think about it, so this is very subjective. It, when we go through it, we feel like it's happening, but nobody else feels the same way. It's also very fragmented. And then the third one I mentioned here is stream of consciousness. In Chinese, we call this yi shi liu. Do you guys know what this is? Okay, so basically stream of consciousness is when the character, or I should say the book, doesn't say blah, 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 he said. It just says blah, blah, blah. And there are no quotation marks, nothing to tell you uh, where it begins and where it ends. It's like directly downloading what a character thinks onto the page. Um, and I think the most famous example also comes from James, jo James Joyce. In chapter three of Ulysses, the entire chapter is written in stream of consciousness. That may not be a problem if you understand the person. But the person who's doing the thinking in this chapter is the philosopher. So he thinks about lots of very difficult and abstract ideas. The novel does not tell us he thought of this, which means this. Then he thought of that, which means that. It just said this, that, that, this, this, that. And we have to figure out what is going on. So today, authors will sometimes use these techniques, but they will use them in a way that is much easier to understand than the modernists use them. Now, World War I had one final major influence on the world. Most people who fought were men. Therefore, most people who died were men. And so there was a major gender imbalance in Europe after the war. 
Women were working jobs that men used to do. Women were leaving the house. The traditional Victorian idea of the angel of the house no longer worked because in order to survive, women also had to take jobs, work in factories, do hard labor. And women felt like if we're doing the same jobs as men, we should have the same rights as men. And so after struggling and after a bombing campaign, finally the government granted women the right to vote in 1918. Um, after World War I, uh, as you can imagine, most of Europe was devastated. And people from many different places were fighting together, getting hurt together, and dying together. And so the first thing that happened after the war was a pandemic, the Spanish flu. I say flu, right? It sounds OK. Everybody sometimes gets the flu, but this flu was really terrible. Like a lot of people died from this. Some historians think that more people died from the pandemic after the war than died during the war. And that's how bad it was. And because it is mostly among soldiers at first, uh, this added to the gender imbalance. Moving on, 1922, the BBC was founded. The BBC began as a radio company. I don't have to tell you how important this is. Also in 1922, Ireland gains independence. For ever since like the 18th century, Ireland has been a colony of England. But after, again, many years of fighting the British and after a local terrorism campaign, they finally were granted independence. At this point, it was, I believe, all of Ireland. I can't quite remember. Today, the island of Ireland is divided into two parts. One part is the Republic of Ireland, which is the south. And the other part is Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK. Uh, and this led to a lot of trouble during the 20th century. The reason why the northern part of Ireland did not want to join the southern part is because of religion. Northern Ireland is part of the English church, or we should say the Anglican church, whereas the Republic of Ireland is mostly Catholic. Um, so before and after Irish independence, you can imagine that Irish people throughout England were very passionate about this issue. And even non-Irish people started to really pay attention to what was going on. So during this period, we had a number of famous Irish writers. Joyce was Irish. William Butler, uh, William Butler Yeats, a poet, uh, was also Irish. He's famous for creating his own mythology. You guys remember when I said William Blake invented his own angels and his own gods? Yeats did the same thing. And then we have Samuel Beckett. Do you guys know this one? Waiting for Gado? Um, Samuel Beckett is Irish, but he decided to write in French. And the reason is because he said James Joyce has already completed the English language. There is nothing I can say in English after Joyce. So instead of using English, he used French. Uh, his work is mostly plays, and his plays are often called absurdist. They mostly deal with people in strange situations, doing strange things, and slowly losing body parts. For example, Waiting for Gado, Dandai Guoto, is his most famous play. In this play, there are two acts. In the first act, two people stand under a tree waiting for a guy named Gado, who they say will be here soon. And they talk about this and that. They argue about trivial, unimportant things. And that's it. In the second act, they do the same thing. 
except the tree now has a flower. And by the end of the play, Godot still has not shown up. That's it. It's very funny. Um, so that's the kind of literature Beckett was writing. In 1929, the Great Depression begins. It, of course, begins in the US, but uh, the, finan the financial world is a global system, so it spreads very quickly throughout the world. In 1936, regular television broadcasting begins. So the TV was invented slightly earlier, but this is when people could regularly watch TV at their in their own home. Before TV, uh, after dinner, if you wanted entertainment, you would either ask your dad to read a book to the whole family, or you would turn on the radio and everybody would listen to it at the same time. If you wanted to have visual entertainment, you had to go to a movie theater. But with TV, now you didn't have to leave home. The visual entertainment could come to you. This, of course, had a terrible effect on the radio industry because apparently people like to see what they're hearing. Um, but it did not have a serious effect on the movie industry. And this is because the first TV shows were like the lowest low kind of low culture. Sensationalism, violence, slapstick comedy, like hitting each other with pies in the face stuff that you wouldn't actually want to leave your home to see. And the only reason you're watching it is because it's there and it's convenient. I guess today the comparison would be with like cell phone games, so you'll, right? You don't want to go somewhere to play this game. You're playing the game because it's already in your hand. Why not? But it doesn't really give you anything except for like a short burst of a little bit of pleasure, and that's it. Um, so like truly quality television had to wait many decades uh, to appear. In fact, some people say that the best television shows happened around 2010. And also in 1936, the Spanish Civil War begins. When we talk about World War II, most people say it begins in 1937, 1939. The real beginning is 1936. It begins with the Spanish Civil War. And that's why uh, I put this on the handout. The Spanish Civil War is between the Spanish king and some guy named Franco, General Franco. Franco was a fascist. He believed in absolute uh, power and control by the government in support of nationalist ideas. Fascist uh, He was also a Catholic, and so the Catholic Church supported him. Uh, now, everybody in the West who believed in democracy thought Franco was not a good idea. And so the Spanish Civil War is not just including Spanish people. People from the US, from all over Europe, joined to fight against Franco, and they lost. So fascism didn't begin with Italy. It didn't begin with Nazi Germany. It began with Franco Spain. Uh, and then, of course, in 1937, Japan attacked China, beginning the Asian part of World War II. In 1939, uh, Germany attacked Poland, beginning the other half of the European part of World War II. Then later, Italy invaded Northern Africa. Uh, and so like the war really became a truly world war. And this went on until 1945 when the war ended. Uh, the US and Europe decided first to win the European part and then to help win the Asian part. Uh, and they won the European part traditional, uh, using traditional warfare, right? Guns, planes, tanks. But they won the Asian part 
with the nuclear bomb, two of them. And the main reason is because the traditional way of winning war in Asia would involve amphibious warfare. Uh, and it would, according to US military planners, it would sacrifice too many lives. So instead of sacrificing their own soldiers, they sacrificed Japanese citizens instead. Now, at the end of World War II, most countries in Europe were again devastated. Everybody was poor, nobody had money, except for two countries. The US, because it was not uh, attacked by Germany, at least the, uh, their country was not attacked by Germany, and Soviet Russia. The Soviet Union, Sudan, was founded in 1917, and it took Russia out of World War I. Uh, as the only socialist communist country in the world, it had a mission to promote communism around the world. Uh, and so it had a lot of power for itself and it had a lot of influence around the world. Uh, and so after the Second World War, the world quickly shaped up into a competition between democracy led by the US and communism led by Soviet Russia. And we call this the Cold War. The Cold War is not cold. It's called the Cold War because the US and Russia never actually fought each other. But everywhere else in the world, Democrats and communists fought actual wars. Think of the Korean War, the Vietnam War. Think about uh, military fights in South America, in Africa. There were many battles during the Cold War, just not between the US and Russia directly. Now, in the middle of this struggle, smaller countries saw an opportunity. If you're trying to win an ideological battle, not a battle with guns, but a battle of ideas, then you need support from other countries. So smaller countries thought, hmm, if you want my support, what will you give me? One thing that some countries got was independence. After the Second World War, around 1957 19, to 1959, so many former British colonies declared independence. And because Britain at the time had just finished being bombed by Germany and was very weak, had no money, had to depend on US support, they couldn't really stop these countries from becoming independent. Uh, so the most famous one is in 1947, India and Pakistan gained independence. At the time, they were one country. And later became two. I don't think that's right. India and Pakistan were two countries. Pakistan later became two countries. Think of the map. India is in the middle. Today we say Pakistan is on the west. But in 1947, Pakistan was on the west and the east. The eastern part was later divided into Bangladesh, Mongjala. No, no, no. You know what? Yeah, India and Pakistan were, were the same country. They were divided later. The idea is that decolonization, Chuzimingwa, was very messy. When countries said we are now independent, the borders of these countries were mostly decided by the British back in the early days. So most famously in Africa, when the European countries came, went to Africa and carved up Africa into different parts, they didn't really care about the local people and the local culture. They only cared about geography and mineral resources. If it's easier to extract resources from this region, then we will include the entire region in the country, no matter how many different kinds of people live here. So after declaring independence, everything was a mess. The same people lived on different sides of the border. 
different people lived in, in the same country. And that's why India and Pakistan later had to separate because uh, they realized they didn't really belong together. With decolonization, you also had immigration. When your home is a mess, you want to go somewhere better. And if you already have some European culture, you might consider going to Europe. And that's why today, uh, co former colonizers and formerly colonized countries still have a relationship because they had the shared period of history and culture. And with decolonization, you also have post-colonial literature, Hou Ziming Wenshui. What is the world like after the Europeans have retreated? What is the new culture like? How do these newly independent countries think about themselves? In 1968, theater censorship is abolished in the UK, finally. And so they had a new uh, cohort of women playwrights who wrote about subjects that previously were not allowed, subjects related to sexuality, women's roles in society, the, the human body and women's bodies, that kind of thing. 1968 is also considered the height of the counterculture, Fan Wen Hua. Uh, for some strange reason, in Europe, in America, around the world, 1968 was the year of protests. Uh, one factor is the Vietnam War, Vietnam. People in the US realized that their government was lying to them, that there was a war, the government kept saying there's no war, and that people were dying for a war that was being lost for no good reason. Uh, and that ignited many massive protests uh, around the world. In France, there was a realization that the Communist Party was not actually working for the people. It was actually working for Russia, and that also led to protests. Many different things at the same time. So starting in around this period, literature is no longer so trusting of authority, no longer so trusting of the country. Whenever the government says something, people started to think, is that true? Uh, for example, there, there's a famous saying in the US. The 10 worst words you can ever hear. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee invents the Internet. The Internet was invented, in fact, by the US military as a way to communicate with each other faster. And it later spread to college campuses before finally spreading around the world as we have it today. So yes, before 1989, we did not have the Internet. 1991, the Soviet Union collapses. The world re now revolves around the US. Communism fails. Everybody thinks that the world will be peaceful forever. Not true. Uh, a different kind of threat later appears after 2001 when terrorists attack the World Trade Center in the United States. And the world suddenly realizes there might be a different kind of ideological struggle. In, let's jump back, 1998, the Good Friday Agreement ends Irish civil strife. So after Ireland gained independence, people kept fighting to let Northern Ireland join them also, and the Northern Irish fought back. This finally ended in 1998, when both sides agreed on a power sharing agreement in Northern Ireland. So today in Northern Ireland, the government must include both sides. 2004, Mark Zuckerberg invents Facebook in the United States. Uh, this is the beginning of the social media era. And in 2007, Netflix begins streaming in the United States. This is the beginning of the streaming era. Before Netflix began streaming, they were a DVD rental business. You can call them, they would send you a catalog, you can choose DVDs, and they will lend them to you. And after you're done, you would mail them back. They kept doing this until like two years ago, actually. Um, but with the beginning of streaming, now you did not actually have to own anything. The problem is, it's also harder for you to own anything. Everything you watch and you listen to belongs to somebody else. And if they don't want to keep it, you can't see it. So these are some of the ideas and situations you can keep in mind as we read 
literature from the 20th century. Next week, we're going to read five poems from World War I. Questions? Okay, see you next week.